Testing, one, two, three. Okay. Make sure I hear myself. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Going live on IGTV now. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna wait like two more minutes before I start. Let me get my notes up here actually. What's happening, y'all? Thanks for joining. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> I'm about to get started in a few minutes. Hey, <laughs> and I'll be in the live chat as well. <clears throat> in case um, those who join me on IG, TV, IG Live, uh, today's live stream, we're going to be talking about SLR Magic Lenses, explaining them what they are, because I've seen a lot of confusion about hyperprimes versus microprimes, anamorphics. So we're going to kind of dive into that. Um, I do have like a little bit of a. Uh, intro to talk through and then we'll go right into it so hope everybody's doing well uh let's all right let's say all right what's up beautiful people it's your boy joshua martin and welcome to today's live stream uh quick house cleaning i know i said Two weeks from now, we're going to do another live stream with another topic. But um, today, today's topic is going to be um, SLR Magic Lenses, explaining what they, uh, what kind of lenses they have, um, as well as uh, some of the questions you all have from um, different ver uh, various outlets from Instagram, um, YouTube, and just things I get on the regular from DMs, uh, people asking me their interest in SLR Magic lenses. Uh, first of all, I just wanna say this is not sponsored by SLR Magic at all, uh, this live stream that is. Um, I have worked with them over the, over the past two years um, on various projects, but this is nothing that's coming from them. I wanted to do this because I am a user of SLR Magic lenses. I really do enjoy um, using those, this glass from anamorphic to spherical lenses. And as well as just, um, uh, and you know, I, I'm an owner. I've, I've actually owned lenses uh, from Insular Magic for the past two years. I bought four lenses when I first started doing serious filmmaking, and um, so I've I've had those lenses ever since. So it's it's been a it's been a really good relationship, I would say. Um, getting to know Andrew and 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 the team there, um, they've they've uh, provided me um, different lenses to loan uh, to use for different types of projects, as well as talk about it. But everything that's going to be said in this video. Um, it's really just coming from my experience, coming from how I use these lenses, um, uh, the downside of these lenses, because there are there are downsides, but um, there's a lot of upside to them as well. Um, that being said, let me see if I still on track with my notes. Da, 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 da. Um, yeah, so the couple of reasons why I want to make this live stream uh, is one, just kind of um, help those who are interested in these lenses and their questions. Um, Cause I know there's quite a bit of frustration when going to the SLR Magic website or just figuring out what lens to buy. Sometimes it's their names are very, uh, their names for each of their lenses can get confusing. You might purchase the wrong lens. Um, I've had several people come to me about that. Look, I'm not a customer service. I am not customer service for SLR Magic, but um, I do feel for you guys and those who think they're getting a particular product, but they end up getting something else. That's not on the company's not necessarily on the company's fault, but I do think that SLR Magic can do a better job of explaining what each lens is and just kind of how they lay things out on the website. Um, and then two is just um, again giving you a better understanding of what's out there in terms of different lenses. I know a lot of people use Rokinon, Sigma, Canon lenses, uh, uh, Pentax lenses. There's, there's a ton of lenses to choose from. So um, SLR Magic is another type of company you can definitely get your hands on and start using them um, for a decent price compared to the market that was out there. All right, so 
this is how it's going to go. Those who are in the live stream on YouTube, I'm going to try to share my screen with you. It might lag a little bit, uh, so stay patient. And those who are on IGTV, uh, IG, um, if you're watching, you're going to just be listening. But if you want to jump on YouTube to see some of the things I'm going to be talking about, um, you can look on, on there. So let me go share my screen right now. Da, 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 da. And again, I'm running with this same... Uh, let me clean this real quick. <laughs> Running with my wife's laptop. Um, everybody has bought up every single bit of uh, um, what's the thing called uh, ca capture cards for live streaming and everything's shot up in price. So it's been a struggle trying to get decent quality out of these uh, webcams. But bear with me. I appreciate you guys so far. Let me get rid of my notes here. Am I sharing my screen? Let's see. Yes. Okay. All right. So this is my Milanote, and we're kind of just go. This is what we're going to kind of walk through. We're going to go through the hyper primes, the APO hyper primes, the micro primes, the APO micro primes, and anamorphics as well. And then we'll get to questions. If you have questions here, definitely just drop them in there. Um, if I don't get to them, um, I'll. If I don't get to them while you're on it, I'll definitely answer them when I can. So. Uh, yeah, so let's start with the hyper primes. The hyper primes and the so okay, so for for, for the hyper primes, from my knowledge, um, these were the first iterations of their Cine uh, Micro Four Third lenses. Uh, so before SLR Magic, if you look on their website, they had this little section called the toy um, toy lenses, and that's what they really kind of started with. I remember Andrew telling me that this was was his first little project. And they would create different toy lenses. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. Hold on. Let's go to this one, right? Oop, not that one. This one. Actually, I meant to have my iPad up here, but bear with me. I'm still getting used to this whole live stream stuff. Okay, yeah. So uh, backtracking. And so I just started. He started making these like toy lenses and whatnot, and then it started to pick up. People were more interested in getting more Micro Four Third lenses because that's when Panasonic was really pushing the Micro Four Third Cine camera lineup. And so um, eventually they introduced several iterations. Um, if you notice, like on uh, like the Hyperprime 25 mil, it says uh, three. So there's like three versions of this. But anyway, let me just, uh, let's just start with this lineup for Micro Four Thirds. This is where I actually started to pick up some of these um, lenses. So I, I purchased the eight millimeter F4. Um, that's a lens I currently have now. It had the 25 uh, T9.5. And eventually I got the whole set, the 50 to 35 and the 10 mil for my GH5 when I started filming. Now the massive, uh, uh, difference between the hyper prime and the micro prime is going to be the design of the lenses and we'll kind of get into that i wish i had an example i do have currently micro primes with me um and we'll get into that i'll show you what those are but i don't have any more hyper primes i sold all my hyper primes to move to get the micro primes see this is where the whole naming thing is funny to me <laughs> but anyway <clears throat> excuse me um so yeah the hyper primes were this very small um, rugged, uh, really built well cine lenses for Micro Four Third cameras. And um, what made them great was one, the size of it, and two, they had a very fast T-stop. Now, was the T-stop usable? Yes and no. Uh, so on a Micro Four Third sensor, you're, you know, you're, you're still the same amount of light coming in, but the effective depth of field is slightly uh, different. So a T9.5 will kind of look like maybe a, what, a, a T to a T 1.4, maybe something like that. And it was super soft, it was super blurry, super dreamy. And that's where um, they start to build their reputation of SR Magic having that dreamy vintage look. And that's what a lot of the characteristics of these lenses have, a very dreamy uh, vintage look, especially when wide open. Um, and so you, with the, the problem with the hyper primes um, from using them is that they didn't, they weren't consistent in design. So the eight millimeter lens is a very tiny lens and it's primarily made, it was made for drones like the Inspire One, which can have an eight, uh, a MFT mount that it can attach. And um, it was great for that, but you can you can all obviously use it for Micro Four Third cameras like the GH4, the GH5, now the Blackmagic Pocket. 
Um, and so um, it's a vector linear lens, but uh, it, it has very small uh, gears where you can change the focusing um, and the whole bear rotates. So there's some flaws in that design in terms of using it as a camera lens versus a, a drone lens. Now with the, the 10 mil and the 25 and the 50, they all have variant, uh, oops, I hit my mic. Can everybody hear me by the way? I'm making sure I can, oh wow, this is blowing up in here. Okay, I'm gonna get to the comments soon. Um, but with the hyper primes, uh, sorry, with the 25, 35, 50 and the 10 mil, um, they all have uh, different um, gear placement. So on the 50, you would have your T stops at the front of the lens and then your focus ring at the back. On the 25 and the 35, you would have the focus ring in the front and the uh, gears and the uh, T-stop ring in the back. So if you're using a follow focus, if you could on a smaller body itself, you always have to reposition that. And that's, you wouldn't consider that professional because you want speed and changing that lenses. Not to say you're making feature length films, maybe short films on micro further systems, but that was a hassle you had to combat. And again, um, the T-stop range did vary drastically. You had a 9.5 versus a T2.1. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> um, again, and another thing that wasn't standardized, <clears throat> man, why am I all gassy all of a sudden? Pardon. Uh, another thing that wasn't standardi standardized was the filter thread. So the 10 mil had a 77 filter thread, as you can see here, and then the 25, 52, 762. So I had so many different step up rings to fit everything, to adapt everything to 82, and that was pretty much a hassle. So, uh, and there's some other little quirks like the 20, the 50 and the 35, they have a lens hood that protrudes or is it that just the 50 if I remember correctly, but as like a built-in lens hood. So just some weird quirks, but again, the image quality was very unique, a very fast T-stop of dreamy image. But if you stop down, you, you can still get a clean look. If you look on my older videos with my GH5, you can see those examples there on my YouTube channel. Now, moving on to, actually, let me jump over to the live stream to see if there's any um, questions I need to, that I can answer. Appreciate you guys being in the chat. I'm planning to get my first, uh, okay, we'll get to that. Hey, yeah, if you can stick around, I'll try to answer these questions um, as soon as I can. All right, I'm just gonna keep going through. So now, they decided to release in 2018 um, I was there for the release at NAB. They released a new set of, a new design, which was the micro primes. Um, oh, let me, before I jump to that, uh, they do have uh, hyper primes in the mi micro for this mount, as well as the E mount. Those are the only two mounts you can get it in at the time. And they are very reluctant to make any EF glass. And we'll get to that a little bit later because obviously they have EF. But uh, Philip Bloom uses these lenses and some other filmmakers they do. Um, I really think these lenses sh these lenses shine on full frame just because it it looks a lot like the Helios 44-2, that vintage Russian lens that everybody kind of uh, is going after. Uh, be just because the way the bokeh swirls in the background, so the edges start to bend and it's a really pleasing look in my opinion. Um, but yeah, so they all had it in the, the Hyperprimes came in micro for third mounts and a Sony E mount at the time. And you can see this, I'm on their website. So you can definitely just jump into their website and look at it yourself. They've updated a lot, still some little quirks, but it's a, it's a vast improvement from what they had before. Now going to the micro prime um, lineup. Uh, so uh, just a short recap, hyper primes were the first iteration of their city line lenses. There's some inconsistencies with the design, uh, filter thread, and the gear placements. Uh, still great lenses, um, but if you're looking for something that's a more complete set that can have a rep uh, that you can that's repeatable when when filming it, then you might want to look at the micro primes. And so here I have uh, the 35 T1.3 micro prime for Fuji X mount, and I've made several videos on this already. You can check it on my channel. Uh, but all the micro primes for the uh, for for Sony E mount, MFT, X mount, all have this design. There is a EF mount. We'll get to the APO version of this as well. Uh, but this has a standardized uh, design. So the, the the gears. Hey, that's my image. So the gear placements are all exactly the same on every single lens. 
um, and they have the exact diameter, 85 diameter and, and an 82 filter thread. Um, what varies is the T-stop. So each lens has a various T-stop. Once uh, the wider, wider lenses have a T-stop range of T2.8 to T3.5, and then they change throughout the range. But um, in terms of being a consistent look, you can still get a consistent look uh, with a lot of these lenses with the micro primes. So um, that's really the huge difference between looking at, uh, oops, I didn't I mean to click that and it's loading. Um, th that's pretty much the massive difference between the hyper prime on the, I will say the, the lower end, I, I don't know how to categorize this, but they have a set for the micro four third sensors and the Sony E-mount sensors. You have more options for the micro primes for different cameras with uh, uh, in the micro prime Cine lineup, if, I, if that made any sense. So basically, like I was saying, you have um, micro four third sensors, uh, sorry, micro four third mounts, Sony E mounts, and then you have the X mount um, for those micro primes. And as you can see here, they have a huge list. They are coming up with some new ones. Um, I, I played around with the 21 mil. The 21 is nice. I think that's a good focal length on a micro four third sensor like the Pocket or the GH5. Um, I just like that 40-ish focal length on it. It's a good, it's a good lens. Um, and I've made a review on the 25 as well. I used the 25. I recently sold that because I bought the APO um, Micro Prime. So let me go backwards again and let me see if I can answer some of these questions here. I'm planning to get my first SLR Magic lens for Fuji. Which lens do you recommend? So, John, we. Um, my question for you is: um, Do you have a particular uh, focal length that you tend to use very often? Like, what is your what is the field of view that you want to capture life in, or capture your your subject in? So, I will start asking yourself that question, and it'll be better recommend. And you can easy answer that question for yourself then then um but my favorite lenses on the x mount i would say is the uh 25 and the 35 um and yeah you might think those are very close but they're actually very different in terms of field of view and so um if you're trying to be a little bit more uh I don't want to say casual, but a little bit more, something that breathes a little bit more when you're looking at it, the 25 is going to be a good fit. Because remember, there is a slight crop factor with these with these APS-C sensors. So the 25 is going to be a good, versatile, standardized field of view, in my opinion. Um, I'm not on OBS, I'm on Zoom. Zoom is, allows me to do this live stream. So uh, let me know how it's doing right now. If it's choppy, I apologize. Um, let's see. I think about buying the eight F four at least. <laughs> I say pull the trigger, or hopefully, I don't know this. I don't know this right now, but hopefully that um, SLR Magic will um, do a redesign, a rehousing of a ultra wide rectilinear lens and the micro prime body or an APO body. Um, all sounds good. From what I've found, the twelve millimeter micro prime doesn't get sharp until. Uh, the 12 micro prime. I haven't used it. Wait, the 12 micro prime on the what's what's um on a Fuji film or the micro four third because I don't think the micro four third one's out yet. Um, but yeah, some of these like unfortunately, this is the case. Sometimes you would get I've got I've had this happen to me too. Like you'll get some of a, a, a dud in terms of um, it was slightly misfocused. All you have to do is just contact us on Magic. They'll they'll be more than happy to work with you because um, you did spend your money on this. Oh, Fuji. Uh, for my maybe that's just I don't I don't know because I I have, I've tested it. it. It looks fine to me. It's it's sharp, wide open in my um, opinion. Now sharpness again, unless it's blatantly off. That's why I always think you should always do a lens test if you're serious about figuring out what lenses you're going to be using. Get a lens chart, test the lenses yourself, see what's sharp, see what's actually off. Because sometimes sharpness is very relative if you're just looking at it and somebody thinks they want to compare it to like a photo lens. So that's a whole nother topic to get into. Um, okay. 
I will get to other lens questions at the end of the video. All right. Maybe that's not a good, should I stop when I do this and answer questions or should I just keep going through with the presentation? Let me, let me guys, let me know in the comments and stuff. All right, let's jump to the hyperprime APO lenses. Now, this is not a lot to talk about. Um, reason being because the uh, APO hyperprime and the APO microprime are the exact same optics. They did not change anything in terms of optics. The only thing they changed was the, was the design of the body. Now, the benefit of having the APO hyperprime, if you're seeing he, it here on my screen right now, um, these have a uh, much more much more robust um, shell of a uh, lens. So you're getting a PL mount, uh, which is a standardized mount. It's a positive locking mount for in the cinema world. Um, you're getting a consistent front threading um, mount. It's 82, but the, I believe the outer diameter is 95. Correct me if I'm wrong. I made a video about this. Um, it's on my channel. Um, and it's all consistent. So you have a range of 30, uh, 25, 32, 50, and 85. I believe they were coming out with two other lenses, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, the special feature of APO, uh, April Chromatic um, lenses, uh, they greatly reduce chromatic aberration as well as spherical aber aber aberration. Wow, I can't say that. Um, and it's, uh, I will be doing some testing because I do have the 25 APO micro prime and I've been doing some testing on that. So basically in high contrast situations, you would normally see like a purple fringing on um, a, a highlight, highlight in a, in, on a highlight in a, um, a line, maybe something or a wire and you see like purple fringing. What's really bad is Rokinon. I'm calling out Rokinon right now on their DS lenses. They have terrible chromatic aberration. It's pink and green you can see it um that that's a good example so with apo uh, does, uh technology and lenses um they greatly reduce that um it's not completely gone even area mist that you can't really get rid of uh uh chromatic aberration even in their signature primes um if you watch that video from potato jet with uh, i forget the guy's name but he's a lens specialist from ari they go through like just the process of making a lens i love that video and um, they just talk about how they design it um, to be as minimal as possible. And they just shifted the hues. So rather than seeing green and pink, you'll see blue and warm, which is more natural to our eyes. Whew, breathe. So um, so that's the special thing with APO um, Sydney lenses. And the really special thing is, is this, the price of it. Um, I'm still kind of baffled how SL Magic got it even lower with the APO, um, APO, APO. <laughs> Micro primes, but the hyper primes, they're roughly between three to they're for about thirty two hundred dollars or so. Now, if you want to get this lens technology in, a, in another Sydney lens, you're spending six, seven, eight thousand dollars or more uh, because it is that it's, it's much needed in the cinema world. You don't want purple fringing, pink fringing in your in your image. That's just that's just really bad. Now, anamorphics, that's another story. We'll get to that soon, too. So. Um, and uh, oh, and another thing with the hyperprimes, the APO hyperprimes, it has a much longer throw. So I think it's almost 300 degrees. It is 300 degrees focus throw. So it's a very precise focus throw. So you need it. You need a focus puller with that, or or um, a wireless follow focus to really get um, those turns precise and nailed. Uh, so you definitely want to consider if you're going to get these. My friend David uh, David Lee, we talked about this. He has a set. Well, he has the 25. And it's uh, it's very interesting to work with it by yourself. But if you have a team, you can definitely work with it. That's what it's really made for. Now, like I, like I was saying, I have the 25 um, APO Micro Prime. You guys have kind of seen it here and there. I'm still working on this long review on it, testing it, and giving my thoughts and whatnot. So that will be coming soon. But like I said, the major difference with the APO Micro Prime and the APO Hyper Prime is just, just the design. Um, Wait, did they change the T-stops? No, no. Okay, yeah, same T-stops as well. Um, <clears throat> and I have it here. Ooh, it's on the FS7 right now. 
And guys, I shoot Blackmagic, Fuji, and FS7. Yes, I shoot all those. I haven't changed cameras. This just depends on the project. Um, but there's the lens, uh, of course, the map box. And it's pretty small. I wish I had all the lenses so I could show you all what they all look like. But this thing is pretty tiny compared to the hyper prime version of it. So this is the uh, Fuji micro prime. And they're all, like I said, they all have roughly the same size. This is the micro prime for APO. And they and this is a little bit longer, and which is great. Pretty light, it's actually still kind of front heavy. The glass elements are near the front. Sorry, I just hit the mic, uh, but yeah, there you go. So yeah, image quality, oh, it's it's so gorgeous. I can't wait to share, share you with uh, my findings and hopefully start filming. Well, I will be start filming a few projects here and there as time goes on. All right, um, what else do we need to go through? Anamorphics, this is gonna be the fun one. Um, now, I just want to say this. I went through several different uh, design, uh, several different lenses for SLO Magic, and I did not say any of them had anamorphic. So just so you know, the micro primes and hyper primes are not anamorphic lenses. They do have anamorphic adapters to fit on these anamorphic. Wow, about to mess up. They do have anamorphic adapters to fit on the hyper prime and the micro prime lenses but there is no micro prime and hyper prime anamorphic lens. Just had to throw that out. I know that's been a very confusing question for a lot of people when they're looking at these things, they think all the hyper primes or all the micro primes are somehow anamorphic. They're not, these are spherical lenses that can be adapted. That's a big difference. All right, let's go to the PL133 anamorphics. Nope, yeah, I'm already here. It doesn't really matter, okay. So the 133 anamorphics uh, is this guy here. Uh, this is a PL, this is the 70, and they all have various T stops. This was a T4, um, all various T stops. I really like this design versus the, pre, uh, versus the Micro Four Third version of the uh, two times anamorphics. And um, reason being, this is a little more compact. With the two times anamorphic, they are very long. Um, again, if you watch my my channel, go to my channel, you'll see that I have several videos on anamorphic lenses, especially with SLR Magic. Um, the two times I use that a lot with the GH5. The image quality is really great. We'll, we'll kind of dive into that. This is more about just talking about the lenses itself. Um, but the the design of it is very long. Um, T the bottom end had most of the glass elements and then it had this long barrel and yada, yada. Definitely needed a lens support if you need one, if you ever have one of these. Uh, one of the quirks with this is that the lens barrel rotates. Uh, it rotates and it's, uh, it protrudes. So I don't know if you can, yeah, it'd be better. It extends upwards. And that can cause problems with follow focuses and map boxes. So unfortunately, you do have to purchase their adapter. And if you go here to accessories, oops, anamorphic adapter. Nope. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, oh, we'll get to that after this standard standard accessories. That's where we'll go to. Right here uh, is their hood, and it's a 114 um, hood, and I purchased it. And basically, just slide. I don't have it right now. A friend of mine is borrowing it right now. Um, it slides in. And um, you, you'll be able to clamp on a, a map box. You've seen a few pictures um, on my Instagram or wherever I post. Um, now, in terms of the look, um, if you're using this on a micro for third sensor, uh, like the GH5, like I use it, um, the strength of the 133 is not very apparent. Um, and that's because the sensor is smaller. Um, and of course, a lot of people don't saw, uh, don't go after the one through three squeeze anyway. Everybody wants a two times squeeze. Rightly so, it's a beautiful look. But there are some there are some really great use cases for the one through three. And eventually, when I get around to that review, I'll talk about a few of those things because I will be doing a project with these lenses um, down the road. But um, yeah, they do. They all have the one through threes. You can tell the difference the difference in the name as well as this has a green stripe on the one through threes, and they're a lot shorter. Again, these are PL. 
and they do come with um and if you are going to adapt this what makes this great is that you can adapt this to um well obviously you can use this on other cameras so you had to screw off this back end here and then that's how you can um, set this into different types of lens mounts so i've used this for the sony uh fs7 here with the wooden camera adapter um, canon um, and of course uh, black magic pocket camera so you, for the micro for third senses you need to have this ring on if i remember correctly now going to the two times anamorphic uh let's go back here uh it's sad that these are only in micro four thirds um it would be great to see this on a super 35 or full frame but of course that's going to get way more expensive you're pushing like atlas or ryan price probably um but as you can see here there's they they all come in the same focal lengths 35 50 and 70 um and the only two times anamorphics is going to be the micro four third mounting option now crazy enough i have seen people send me pictures on the uh they've adapted they cut off the back and put a different mount on it to put on other cameras um sure if you want to do that if you're if you, if you are a specialist in converting lenses by all means do it that's probably a cheap the cheapest way to get an anamorphic lens because these anamorphic lenses go between I think th around three thousand dollars. Now the PL versions of these, the one through threes, go for about six, about six a piece, six seven a piece. Um, so there's that. All right, almost there. Um, let's get through this and we get to all the questions too. About thirty minutes. Okay, I'm doing okay with time. Now adapters. This is something I know a lot of people have asked me. I I used to own the um uh the two times 50 this one here that was when i first started to get into anamorphic and that was a hassle honestly uh so the adapters what you have to do you have to have a taking lens so the lens that actually goes on your camera then you would purchase the adapter which was screw on and you always have to make sure it's aligned so it has the back focus ring so once you screw it in make sure the oval of the uh, the iris is vertical then you screw it in tighten it um, and then uh, if you don't get the range finder, and I'll talk a little bit about that too, but if you just have one of these adapters here, and we'll talk about which filter size, filter threads fit what, if you have one of these adapters, depending on the lens, you need to um, do a focus. So you'll, there's a near and a far feature on each of, the, each of the adapters. And then depending your scene, you set it to near or far, and then you focus it from your lens. Now they have an, another attachment called the range finder and the range finder makes it a single use, uh, single, uh, what's the term for it? A single focus basically. <laughs> um, meaning once you have another piece of glass in front, so you have a range finder, which looks like, the range finder looks like this, this piece. So imagine this, just this, right? And I had that too. The range finder will screw onto the front of your anamorphic adapter, the adapter screws onto the lens. And so you basically set your lens and adapter to infinity, and then you can focus just on the range finder itself. And that's how you make it a single lens system basically with that. I hope I just answered that question because I just said it. Um, so you need to make this a whole, to make any of these except for the 40 compact, but to make anything a single, uh, Okay, they changed something. So let me backtrack a little bit. So to make any of these um, adapters a single lens, a single focus setup, except for the 40 compact and the 1 through 365 adapter, um, you need the range finder and the range finder fits in the front of the lens. So you set your taking lens and the adapter to infinity and then you can focus just on the range finder itself it gets pricey that way but that's the best way you can do it at least you don't have to buy another lens you can just adapt your lens to whatever it is that makes this more flexible in terms of you can use any camera now with this you just figure out what squeeze factor you need so of, of course 2x if your camera can shoot a 4x3 image then you'll use a 2x adapter but any 16x9 um, camera sensor you want a 133 and so 
getting to the compact. Let me just click on the compact so we can actually look into this. Um, again, this is made for smaller lenses. Um, you always have to look at what is the rear focusing, uh, what is the rear filter thread? Because the rear filter thread is going to determine what lens mount you can actually put it on. So it says here on their website, uh, okay, she doesn't have tap to zoom, great. Mounts, uh, mounts to lenses with the uh, 52 front thread. So any lens that has a 52 front thread, you can mount the uh 13340 compact on there. So you gotta you gotta look at that because that's that's gonna trip some people up. Um, let's go to the 13350 adapter. Uh, I think they say it here. Yes, any lens that has a 62. Now, if you have a 62, what did I do? I did some type of crazy experiment. I like did a step down ring, a step up ring. I had to look at that. I had to find that video. Um, Oh yeah, because I had a Vader and the Vader had a 77. So I used a step down ring from 77 to 62 to fit my 50. That was very interesting. I have a video on that as well. Um, yeah, so you just have to look. If you go on the website uh, or BNAs, I think they tell you on BNAs too, they'll say what the rear filter thread is. So like I said, this is made for smaller lenses. Um, you could go the the step down ring route like I did. You just got to just crop on the side. It's just, just going to be you're going to see the barrel of the step up ring, the barrel of the step down ring on the sides. I talk too fast. I'm just gulping in air. That's what that's what you're hearing right now. Um, but again, if you have a oh, this is the only so this is the only adapter with the two X, and it's pretty. Th it's a thick boy too. It's about this long that adapter from what I remember. Um, but you want to use that with four by sensor, four by three sensor. So like a Z cam, um, the GH5, Panasonic GH5. Um, even now the, the black magic has a two, a four by three crop in the center. You can definitely use that as well. Um, lower resolution. That might be actually interesting to, to try out. I might, I might have to get my hands on something. Uh, but, oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> There's a whole chart down here. And then, yeah, so make sure to just read these charts. Read these charts and it's definitely going to give you a, a good insight. Rule of thumb, you want to use, oh, actually they give you, yeah, here you go. Suggested taking lenses for the sensors. Brilliant. That's, I'm glad they added that because I know I got a ton of questions about that when I go to these trade shows. Um, okay, I think, I think that's it. Let's uh, answer some questions now because I got, Less than 30 minutes. Wow, 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 wow. You guys are great. Okay, let me go up a little bit. Um, I'm not going to reply. <laughs> I'm just going to just talk about it right in here. Uh, let's go through this first. I know it's random, but I'm looking for a nice piece of glass for my Nikon Z6. Um, DM me. We can talk about that later. Um, did you see a big difference in the rendering between the hyper primes and the micro primes? Yes, I actually, there was a big difference. Um, because you don't get a solid image with the hyper primes until you get to T2, uh, T, possibly a T2, uh, or T2.2. Um, you had to stop down quite a bit to get a, uh, a, con a little bit more contrast in your image. Um, but the micro primes, um, they uh, render their image a lot better, especially wide open. If you get a, if you get a, a good model, um, like I said, there have been some stories out there. Not everybody, but some stories. Um, but the color rendition, um, the contrast level, I I don't like a very contrasty lens because I like to add my own contrast. So uh, the mere fact that these lenses do kind of bloom and flare quite a bit, if you don't have anything to flag it off, um, it does bring up the the contrast level. So then you can you know, bring it down a little bit later. Good question. Um, have you compared these micro primes to the, the Mikey Cine primes? Thanks for live stream. So I've been meaning to get my hands on a Mikey Cine prime, um, but right off the bat, I can tell you that they're going to be very different lenses um, because the Mikey prime, the Mikey Cine primes, um, from what I've seen on YouTube, um, they're they're trying to be a very clinical look um, to that is a very minimal characteristic not it's not bad or anything it's like using the 18 to 35 it's a very minimal characteristic so less flares um, less distortion um, 
nothing really interesting when wide open. On the flip side, SLR magic lenses across all of the board, you're going to get some weird distortion, some weird bokeh, in a, weird in a positive light because I like using that. Um, and so it's going to be a very different feel um, in terms of like how the color temperature is rendered. Because uh, I noticed with this lens, maybe it's just this lens, but there's a green shift with this lens with the APO 25, um, easily corrected in post, but like this, it's more warm. It's green and warm when when filming with this uh, compared to like using 1835 or a Um I want to throw some anamorphous NT3. Yeah, you totally can. Like I just went through, you can get an adapter. Um, you just find, you can use whatever lens you have as, as, as well as, as long as it has the proper thread or you can use a step down ring to thread it on, but you can totally use anamorphic. You just need a monitor to de-squeeze the anamorphic so you can see it. Cool, I'm glad it's not choppy at all. Um, stopping is stopping is fine. APO usually means there are apochromatic elements, the parts are redesigned, the sugar you do. Yeah, I don't know about the home as the distortion because there is some distortion on this lens on the wider end for the APO line, but there is a, a massive reduction in chromatic aberration, which is good to know. Go full screen, we can't see. Um, someone get this man a second monitor. <laughs> Yeah, man, I it's, it's, it's struggles real, but hey, we're gonna we're gonna. Um, oh, am I live streaming on this one? Let me stop sharing my screen. Hold on. All right, there we go. I'm still looking here. Um, let's see. There was a Kickstarter for a 50 mil anamorphic lens that looks pretty dope. Thoughts? I haven't seen it unless you're talking about the Suri Suri anamorphic. Um, send me a link, Crispy B, if you can. Uh, oh, yes, sir. Yeah, it was them. Um, it's a one through three. Uh, I wish they had gears on it, but that's just me. Um, I've seen some decent tests from it as well. Oh, the April Hyper Prime Cine 50 T2 is 1500. Uh, that's kind of nuts for a full frame. I know, right? Like, just that price for a full frame lens. Oh, actually, wow, I did not talk about the coverages. Um, Hmm. Well, if you if you make if you think about it, if you're if the if the mount fits the camera, then it's gonna it should cover that lens. So these are the only EF my I totally forgot about this. This is the only EF uh, mount that SLR Magic currently makes, and this thing is less than fifteen hundred dollars now, which is fantastic for the price. What you're going to get in terms of quality um, and the characteristics of this lens. It's a modern vintage lens. So you're going to get some um, interesting flares, some rainbow flares. You're going to get some swirly, um, distorted bokeh in the background. Um, it's not going to be your pristine, crisp, all across, wide open. It's not going to do that. It's going to have a little bit of softness. And the softness actually aids skin tones, uh, uh, skin texture, that is, I mean. So um, definitely something to look at uh, as I continue to make videos. Um, why did I even say that? I don't even know. Oh man, you guys are awesome. This is a lot going on in here. Um, yeah, I need a whole better live setup. I'm doing what I can, guys. Stay with me. Appreciate y'all. Stay with me. Stay with me. Um, SLR Magic spherical lenses are much better than anamorphic adapters. Yeah, so you're you're gonna run into a lot of spherical aberration with the adapters. Um, and it really depends on the lens that you're using too. So one thing when I was adapting the Vager to the 50 anamorphic adapter, uh, the Vager suffered a lot from chromatic aberration, especially wide open. And so that just kind of amplified with the anamorphic lens, uh, uh, anamorphic adapter on it. So you got to understand what lens you have. Um, so probably with photo lenses, you'll, you'll see less chromatic aberration because they try to correct that anyway. Um, but uh, something to keep in mind. Good, good point. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm trying to get through this. I got 15 more minutes before. Whoa, I got 15 more minutes until IG goes away, and I need should actually go to these questions. Um, so I'm gonna split real quick and go to IG because these questions are gonna go by pretty, pretty quick. Wow, wow, wow. There's a lot of people. Not anymore. But thanks for guys for joining. Um, let's see. There's no Afro emoji. <laughs> okay. 
Appreciate the love. Oh, from Saudi Arabia. Appreciate you, man. Random random yes or no question. Are you still using Millinote? Yes, I'm using Millinote for every single project management for my own work. Have you thought about buying a Zcam since it, since, since it suited more for anamorphic? No, I'm not in the market for buying another camera right now. Um, though, yes, it is suited for anamorphic, a better suited because it has it could shoot four by three. Um, I'm okay. I can live with what I have. I can live with what I'm doing currently. Um, S1, can you? S1, you can use, if. cool, good to know. Is the 6K better purchase rele relevant to the 4K now that it's going down in price? I'm looking into getting, I'm looking to invest in a lens uh, set. What do you prefer between SLR Magic or the Leica R? Whew, Leica's nice. Um, so the reason why I stick with the po stuck with the pocket, I, I saw that they did bring the price down, but the reason why I stuck with the pocket is that now I can use the, 0.64 metabones adapter which will give me a 1.2 crop viewing angle on the sensor now 4k is enough for me um and so i wanted a more wider field of view so i can start using and start investing into full frame lenses that's the main reason too i was moving towards that um that's why i've been selling my micro prime lenses because i'm just switching out stuff and so um <clears throat> that's my main reason um, I know there are some benefits with the 6K in terms of the noise level, but that's to me, that's pixel peeping. If you want to get the 6K, if you already have Canon glass, by all means, go for it, especially if the price did drop. That's a, that's a benefit. You still have to build it up somewhat, um, depending on how you're going to be using it. Um, so when, when, when I get questions about comparing which uh, lenses to purchase, Leica, Leica is going to be a really solid lens. Um, um, what's his name? Matteo... Bardinelli, I think that's his name. He's a cinematographer down in Florida now. He does a lot of comparisons with the like R to like Sigma Glass and Sigma Glass and other things. Um, check out his work because I haven't really tested like R Glass yet. Um, but it, for the most part, it's a very clean, um, clean neutral lens. Like I said, some of those lenses they always tend to want to be on the perfect side. So if you're going to look for, if you're looking for character, character meaning you're going to have some type of different um bulkhead some type some little bit of vignetting some some different organic flaring like those things in terms of character is going to be very different from other lenses like leica lenses or sigma lenses so um i hope that helped uh great question though what are your thoughts on the tamron cine lenses for micro for third Tamron, they have what do they have? I don't mean actually, I actually I don't know what they have for cine lenses. I need to look that up. I need to look that up. I'm not sure. Okay, last two questions. Um, what about adapter that use with the Black Magic Pocket 6K? Make it like full frame. Oh, the the um, what's it called? Um, the Luca adapter, I think. Um, I think that's kind of cool. Uh, yeah, it, it makes it a full frame field of view. Um, you can do that with the Ursa Mini pro g2 as well and as well as the 6k um i would if i had that i would do it i would try to make a full frame it's, it's the more affordable full frame uh 12 bit raw camera you can get i guess right instead of getting the s1h 6k for like six thousand dollars four thousand dollars something like that so um if you don't mind doing it yourself if you don't feel confident you might want to send it to a camera company to do it but if you I say try it. I would do it. If I had the money to get a 6K, I would get the adapter to make it full frame. Definitely. Because the 1.5 crop, if I'm going for micro four thirds, I would want something wider than a 1.5 crop. Okay. That's everybody on IG. Appreciate you guys. This is going to be ending in a few minutes, but I'm going to still finish up on here. Okay. I'm back. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, let's see. Sony has a shallower flange distance than Micro Four Thirds. Can you mount a two times SLR Magic lens glass on this FF7? I have not tried that because they don't make um, adapters for Micro Four Third lenses to um, Sony E mounts. I've never seen that in my life. <laughs> It'd be a great experiment. Maybe you had to adapt the entire lens. Um, to email, but you can't. From from my knowledge, there's no micro four. There's no Sony email to micro four third lens. Yeah, I've never seen that before, actually. 
is it just a preference and look of the lens or the optics better with the spherical lens? Um, so yeah, to piggyback. So in terms of the anamorphic lens, uh, so the SLR Magic anamorphic lenses across the board are notoriously soft, um, especially at their widest T-stop. You can get a generally good image around stopping down, stopping down one or two stops, probably two stops on the safe side to get a more, you know, uh, pleasing image in terms of your eye trying to fixate or where to look. Um, but there are some tricks to the trade. Um, but he's he's just saying that spherically, yes, the lenses are better um, optically, especially wide open, um, and especially in the micro primes that is too. The adapters are are going to struggle, especially if your taking lens is not that um, well put together. I didn't know what I didn't know what I was going to say there. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, you you got it. You're all over the answering his question. I just want to read something. They require dual focus. Yeah, if you don't have the range finder object quality, if it takes a hit, uh, there's no quite strong blue cast. Yep, 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 yep. All correct. All correct. Did you set up? Did you set up to step down? <laughs> Jokes. Jokes. Uh, most of the time you step down to get a larger lens to fill in a small adapter. You pretty get yes, you will get significant vignetting since the Vajra has a front optics is a little bit deeper than the recess. Yes. Man, you're on it. Bro, we need to have a, a talk. You uh you're on it. Um, I wonder if Rich Gal has an, an involvement with Slur Magic. They seem to have a similar preference with rendering. Hmm. Okay, direct question. What is the most affordable SLR Magic lens you can recommend for micro four thirds around 25 under $500? Um, find it used. Because uh, I think I think the micro hyper prime is still going for just under 500, well, actually it might be 300 maybe. Check on Adorama, check on eBay, check on all these other sites. If you do wanna get a 25 for the Micro Four Thirds sensor, you're gonna to have to probably get it used because right now new, I think this is around $500 for the Micro Prime. It might be less with the Hyper Primes, but you might have to do some searching. Oh, around 25 mil. Okay, that focal length. Uh, yeah, you, you're gonna have to do some searching. I can't, I don't know from the top of my head right now. At least last time I'll peek your brain, the Duvo trucks is for Fuji. Oh, interesting, 33 millimeters. That's weird. What does that come out to? Cause you had a 1.5 crop. That's interesting. That's a very interesting focal length. Stay healthy, stay happy. Yep, appreciate you, Nate. Same, moving my lenses to full frame, Sigmas. Good move, good move. Okay, Sony and Micro Four Third are only about one to two millimeters difference. The flange distance too close to adapt, but you could possibly find a shop that could convert it. Yeah, you have to find a shop. So compact anamorphic adapters doesn't need dual focusing. No, not the compact. Um, so, well, sorry. Yes, it does still need dual focusing. You just can't use a range finder to make it a single focus system. Hope that makes sense. Okay, I have some other questions on my Miller note reconnecting. Why are you reconnecting? I don't understand. I have great internet. This is very strange. Let me close it out. Give me a second. Am I still am I still recording on the stream? Let's see. Let's see. I am. I am. I am. I am. <clears throat> Okay, let me go over here. Let's go to these questions. Actually, I'm gonna bounce back over on Instagram. I got a couple more minutes. Okay, uh, how does one archive a cinematic look in their photograph? Um, study light, study color. Cinematic is a feeling, it's not a um, particular color grade. Um, but if you study those things and understand how light creates, because cinema, all it does is redirect your eye to what you want to see in the, what the artist, what you just see in the frame. That's cinema to me, really. So in your case, if you want to have more cinematic feeling images, cinematic look, you should 
study those things and learn how to use that to your subject matter, to what you're photographing, to what you're filming. That's going to give you the best cinematic look. And eventually you'll start to see what that cinematic cinematic magic looks like to you. Yeah. <laughs> what, kind, what type of camera would you suggest for a extremely novice, super beginner, aspiring filmmaker? Your iPhone. If you have an iPhone 11, you're good to go. Get some moment lenses, maybe a little bit, a little bit of investment, some moment lenses, you're good to go. Because the iPhone camera is, is pretty insane what you can get out of that. Um, if you're talking about super beginner, because super beginners just you just need to understand how to frame, how to comp, how to use composition. I'm done with an iPhone. <laughs> what what phone are you using? I used it a lot already. So you're talking about you just want to move up from there, huh? So okay, if what's your budget then? What what do you what are you trying to spend? How much are you trying to spend? That's the next question. I'll, I'll kind of peek back over if, if you uh, reply. Um. I want to step up my game. How much are you? Well, okay. Before this ends, just DM me. Um, and we can go back and forth a little bit. All right. I'm going to go back to these questions here. This is from the dream catcher. In your opinion, are the, in your opinion, are the APO micro prime, a good investment as a cine lens? Absolutely. Um, for one. So the next, in terms of uh, the, the, uh, the market, where these lenses sit, the next thing you would compare this to is the Rokinon Zine in terms of price. Cause like I said, this goes for under $1,500. And so the Rokinon Zine is, the first version is around $1,600, $1,700. And the Rokinon Zine CF goes for almost twice that, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so in terms of price itself, if you wanna get into a Cine uh, lenses, this is something you might wanna look at. But again, you have to understand um, what kind of characteristics you look for in a lens. Um, this is gonna be vastly different from a broken on in terms of the way it flares, the bokeh looks. So um, if you're starting to invest in these things, do some research. Again, ask me, I'm hopefully I'm gonna get a video out soon so you can see what some of these differences are. But um, yes, I, I, if you're looking for something that has nice character, um, this might be the lens for you. If not, broken on zine is something you can look in as well, or whatever lens in this category in this price range. Okay, the next question with the micro primes: Have you used any lens filt uh, filtration like black uh, black pro mist? If so, what are the results? Also, are you used to screw on? Are you using screw on or drop in filters for the matte box? Like I see in your rig. Thanks for you done. So yes, I have used black pro mist on. Um, a lot of my videos. Um, but what, one nice thing about SLR Magic lenses that I've noticed, um, they do have a slight bloom already in the highlights. So they roll off a little bit more organically uh, without using any filters. So if I want to amplify that, I will put a Pro Mist 1 8 or 1 4 um, So yes, I have used it. Uh, one video you can watch is the, um, I've done a couple of dance videos and some of the highlights, if you notice, I have used a pro mist in there in conjunction with the lens itself. Um, the 25 mil had a nice organic bloom already for the micro four thirds sensor. So um, yes, cool, great question. I like that question. Okay, this is from Instagram. Can you use a single focus with these Anamorphot 65 APO oh, and the APO micro primes? So, with the 65 and a Morphot, that is their newer, much larger um, anamorphic adapter that's for zoom lenses. And they they highlighted a lot with the Fujinon MK line, the 18 to 55 and the 55 to, I forget the other range. Um, unfortunately, you cannot use a single, it's not a single focus uh, solution. You have to um, set your focus to infinity. My daughter's in the bathroom right now. <laughs> Sorry, every time I hear, I just want to laugh. Um, <laughs> she loves bath time. This is great. Anyway, um, yeah, unfortunately, you can't. You can't use the uh, anamorphot as a single lens. Wow, I just lost my whole train of thought. Wow, wow, wow. Babies, y'all. Babies. Um, what do you need in order to use one of the anamorphic lenses with the back magic pocket? So if you're going to be using the native 
and a Michael Further mount, <laughs> like the two times anamorphic, you don't need anything because the Blackmagic Pocket allows you to de squeeze that image and camera, and you can use the crop factor uh, for the two times anamorphic. You have to actually use the two times, well, you can use the two times anamorphic setting in that camera. Before they had that, I did a whole short film without using that feature and I used the full width of the sensor. Granted, you still have to chop off a lot of your uh, frame, but I kept it a very, um, my aspect ratio was like 2.66 to one aspect ratio, which I really enjoyed playing around with that. So there's different ways, but um, you can either use the, the adapter or you can use the straight up tilting, um, the straight up, um, uh, wow, well, Instagram just went away now. You can use a straight up micro four thirds mount on it. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. What do you think is the main go-to anamorphic prime size? So if you saw earlier, you can actually see on a chart on the website which lens they recommend based on the sensor that you have. So rule of thumb, you want to use a 35 uh, to get the widest field of view you can with the anamorphic. But you can use anything after 35 and you're pre pretty good. 85 might be the longest you want to go but you can use anything in between after 35. Um, when do you think it's best to use anamorphic? I like this question. Um, what I think is best to use anamorphic, if you want to take the viewer out of this, uh, if, you want to if you want to get the viewer a real experience visually, um, anamorphic is the way to go because it's a it's such a different way of seeing the world through video just because it's it it breaks down it's kind of messy it's a uh, it's smeary it's it's it has these interesting flares it's just this interesting look it gets uh, interesting distortion it's, it's just a different look on life from your regular standard you know video camera or the way we normally shoot things um, it just takes you to another place video Visually. So I think that's when is a great time based on your story or just, you know, just want to have a different aesthetic. Um, using anamorphic just enhances those things and just takes the viewer to a different uh, reality, in my opinion. That's why I liked it. That's why I used it on the project um, uh, Lost Souls, because Lost Souls is a very uh, vulnerable uh, discussion about depression. And so um, how can I translate that to some of the things that feel kind of messy or distorted or, or awkward or weird? Anamorphic allowed me to translate some of those ideas visually, in my mind, that's what I thought it did, um, in that story. So that's what I think is a great time to use anamorphic. And other, if you just like anamorphic, you can use it. I mean, sometimes that people do overuse it, I think, um, but that's another conversation. In your opinion, oh, wait, that's all the questions. Okay, cool. I was about to sound like a repeated, broken down, uh, uh, record player. All right, let's get back to this. I'm actually going to wrap up pretty soon and get need to wrap up these first. Yo, bro, Sean with the man. Yo, it's good. Uh, sorry, that was a lot. Um, the, the, I was debating using with the Ventus Olympus 28. I've seen it on the 28 actually. So There's some videos on Vimeo, which was pretty interesting to look at. Um, but I experiment. Like, here's the thing. Like. I might recommend something, but go ahead and experiment. Like we're in, we're in the field of making things unique to us and, and unique to whoever we want to share it with. So um, recommendations only go so far. I really think you just, if you have it, try it, um, test it, learn, learn from it, and then see how you can refine it. That's, that's what I do all the time. I don't really care what people, I shouldn't say that. I, I care to a certain extent, but if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it, <laughs> you know, shoot. Um, I could, I could hit them up, see what they say. It might be interesting. People starting out, grab a little Sony A7, A6000, A6000, A6, really nice image, good autofocus and cheap, cheap, cheap. Yeah, it is cheap. Swit, oh, you mean Swit versus Atomos? Uh, if you need, re so those are very two different monitors. If you need the recording features of a Atomos Shogun, you get the Atomos. If you need to record ProRes and get the best quality out of your camera, you go that route. If you just if you just need a viewing monitor, like this guy, I just get Swit. Uh, not Swit. I'll just get a monitor that has just 
viewing stuff. So Switch is like the cheap, cheap version of small HD. Cheap as in quality at times. Price, not so much. You can get a decent Switch five inch monitor for like 250 or less, I think. But yeah, I would do that definitely. All right, guys. Um, I appreciate all you who just dumped, jumped in and started talking. I do got to figure out this whole live stream stuff. I'm still super new to it. Um, but I, again, I appreciate you all. Um, the next conversation we're probably going to have, well, I'll, I'll announce it in a week or so once I, once I figure out what's next. But um, if I didn't answer you guys' questions, feel free to hit me up on Instagram, um, Joshua Martin Studios, and uh, hit me up in DMs. But until then, I catch you guys in the next one. Peace.